Raylin. Raylin, 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 Raylin. Raylin. Some of you are rather annoyed with me. Nobody more annoyed with me than Raylin, right? Because throughout the service so far today, I have said her name somewhere in the area of 17 times. Never once actually wanting a darn thing from her other than to annoy her and each and every one of you. Because instead of a traditional opening illustration, I have been performing the opening illustration since the beginning of the service. If you have been annoyed with me for constantly calling on Ray Lynn only to ignore her or declare never mind, understand there was a purpose behind it. Nobody's been more annoyed at it than she has. And, and, and Imagine how much more annoying would it be if one of your greatest desires in all the world were to be to have a conversation with me. But every time I called your name, I ignored you. How devastated would you be if you really, 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 really had something you wanted to say to me, but with each apparent opening of the conversation, each time I said your name, I went on about my business, not saying a thing to you and not even waiting to hear what you have to say. That would stink, wouldn't it? Right now, the last thing Raylan wants to do is talk to me. Punch me, maybe, but imagine if there was nothing she wanted in all the world more than to talk to me. And every time I've said her name, she went, ah. <laughs> That would really stink if that was her one sole desire. Maybe not sole desire, but one of her greatest desires was to talk to me. And every time I still go to open a conversation, I then close it without giving her any regard. So why do so many of us do it to God? Why do we allow it to be done to God? How many of you thought at least at some point of saying, James, would you just leave Raylin alone? That poor girl. Anybody think that poor girl, you want to stop me? Raylin did. Why don't we treat God's name as special and sacred and reserved for conversations with him and about him? Why is his name not holy to us? Worse yet, we've made his name into a swear word. Brothers and sisters, this should not be. I'm going to read today's passages, one out of Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, and then we're going to jump to Matthew chapter 5. It'll actually be all over uh, the Bible today, so bear with me, though. It'll each be on the screen, and you watching at home uh, can certainly pause it and find it in your Bibles. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Matthew 5, 33 through 37. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Commandment number three that we study today regards taking the name of the Lord in vain. The third commandment doesn't deal with internal worship. That's the first commandment. And it doesn't deal with external worship. That's the second commandment. But it has to do with the profession of the mouth in true adoration of God. The name of God stands for much more than the mere utterance of his title. It includes his nature, his being, his person, his teaching, his doctrine, his moral and ethical expectations, his holiness is all wrapped up in the name of God. And the, and the misuse, the taking in vain of God's name means to use it for no purpose or for the wrong purpose. What are some vain uses of God's name? Well, I like to think of it as uh, to express surprise or express delight in non-godly things. Maybe not necessarily sinful things, but things that aren't about God's character, his actions, or his grace. Oh my God, what a cute sweater. That sweater does not declare the glory of our majestic God. OMG, can you believe she said that? Oh my God, where did I put that thing? I'd lose my God-blessed head if it wasn't attached to my neck. 
to express surprise or express delight in non-godly things or to fill in gaps in conversation, speeches, prayers. What are you doing today? Oh, God, um, man, I, uh, oh, Jesus. Uh, I think I'm going to go to... And if you're not deeply offended at what I'm doing right now, we really need to have a conversation. Because we do this over and over again. And you say, yeah, well, yeah, I'm deeply offended. I wish he wouldn't say that. I'm going to be very cautious and, and stop doing this at this point because you get my point. But here's one that may hit a little closer to home to us who are good Christian boys and girls who don't necessarily do that, who, who, who the, the, the hair on the back of our neck stands up when we hear those things. How about this one? Oh, dear Lord, I just pray today that you, dear Lord, would see fit, oh God, to heal my hamster, Heavenly Father, and that you, Almighty, would... You ever hear those prayers? Can you imagine having a conversation with someone who did this to you? It might not be offensive, but it would sure be annoying. Hey, Chad, how about Chad? Tomorrow, Chad, if we uh, were to come into the office, Chad, and do some Chad uh, things, uh, Chad, and then... Thank you. Okay? And I don't think this is meant to be disrespectful. I know a lot of Christians who pray this way. The problem isn't that it's intentionally offensive. It simply shows a lack of awareness about just how special God's name is. That we throw it in when we're trying to think of what we want to say. And if it's meant to remind the one praying, I've heard this before. I've asked people, you know, why do, why do you say Lord every third word in your prayer? Well, it's just remind me who I'm praying to. Well, who else are you praying to on Monday through Saturday? You have to remind yourself, oh yeah, it's God today. That's right, yeah. If it's simply a nervous thing, something we, we do when we have to pray in front of others, then why don't we fill in those, those nervous moments with something a little less sacred? There's nothing wrong with a little um now and then. When you're talking in front of people, um is perfectly acceptable. Well, you're praying, and it's like, well, I can't say, um, so I'm just going to say the name's Lord 73 times. No. And if it's to show others our holiness, then it really defeats the purpose because it only reveals that we don't understand the third commandment and take it seriously. It also proves that we're not praying to God, but praying with our minds on the people around us and what they are thinking. So we might as well pray to them. And if this is you, if you're one of those people, when you're praying out loud, you tend to throw in Lord and Father and, you know, all these different titles and names of God as, as filler. Let me just say, you are not alone. So let me say, work to improve this. Pray more, get more comfortable praying, and be aware of your tendency to disregard the holiness of God's name. Like every shortcoming or deficiency or sin, it will probably be a process to work this out of your prayer life, but it will be worth it as you begin to treat the Lord's name with the sanctity that it deserves, even while you are in conversation with him. A third vain use of God's name is to confirm something that is false or upon which God has not staked his reputation. And there are a thousand examples I could share of misusing the Lord's name, the act of eternal condemnation. But let me simply say this. To say God damn in any combination is a prayer. It is a prayer to the Lord and righteous judge of the universe to send that thing that is inconveniencing you to hell forever. That is the meaning of the word damn. So the next time you hear or use that phrase, realize the, the power God says that prayers have and reconsider. Or as we addressed in Matthew chapter 5, when people say, I swear to God, I've never... Do not swear by what is in heaven or on earth. These are just a few of the ways we can take the Lord's name in vain. I will not spend any more time going down that road. We're all familiar with this concept. But if God's name is used lightly, how shall the righteous survive in times of distress? At this point, I'd like to take a look at the picture on the screen behind me. And I chose this picture to convey one of the great truths of Scripture found in Proverbs chapter 18. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Let me ask you this. Would you take the bricks out of a wall if you knew the enemy was going to lay siege soon? Would you drain the oil from your car before a long, grueling trip through the desert? Would you make your house out of paper mache if you lived in an earthquake zone? Would you pour gasoline on your home when a wildfire is threatening to consume it? 
Of course not. We would do none of these things because it cheapens and weakens our defenses. Why then are we okay with using God's name in vain when it is a strong tower into which we can run for safety? And understand this, there is nothing we can do to weaken his name. His name is powerful, but the misuse of his name weakens our faith in his name. And it turns it into something mundane and common in our minds when it is so much more in reality. Even surrounding yourselves and allowing yourself to constantly hear his name abused makes it common when it ought not to be. And you say, well, you know, James, that's all well and good, but um, why is God so protective of his name? It's just a name, right? Well, it is a very special name. Acts chapter 4, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I have nothing to add to this, because if that doesn't qualify his name as special, singularly, spectacularly, astoundingly special, then nothing does. Because his name is holy. If companies can copyright their names so no one else can use them for unpermitted things, why can't God? Do you understand we can't legally use the term Super Bowl to reference today's game? Today happens to be Super Bowl Sunday. But if we were to use that phrase, that's why we've always had a superb owl party, right? Superb owl party, because we can't legally send out the word Super Bowl associated with our business or our church because it's a copyright infringement. The World Wrestling Federation of my youth became World Wrestling Entertainment because the World Wildlife Fund had WWF already locked down and they couldn't share a name. Nickelodeon TV, or, or I think it's Nickelodeon or Disney, the kids on there always use pair pads and pair phones. Why? Because Apple charges too much to use their name and likeness. If I tried to sell you Coca-Cola that was orange and tasted like mud, would you complain? You'd say, I, this isn't Coke. I ordered a Coke. Where's my Coke? Of course you would, because a name means certain things. And to misuse that name is to steal from the name holder and rep misrepresent who they are. God's name is holy, and it is set aside for him and him alone. Because names are important, and we recognize the importance of names. New Zealand, for instance, has officially banned the names Messiah. 89, that was a name that somebody tried to give their kid, and New Zealand said no. Adolf Hitler. You cannot name your child Adolf Hitler in New Zealand. A nine-year-old girl here in America sued her parents and won because they named her Tallulah Does the Hula from Hawaii. Here's an actual name that was banned by the Swedish government after it appeared on the birth certificate of the baby in that country. They said that, B-R-F-X-X-C-C-X-X-M-N, it's pronounced Alban. And the Swedish government said, no, you can't do that to your kid. Because names have meanings. Names are special. Names give much less meaning today than they did in Bible times, but they still convey very much more about the person, product, or idea than a random group of letters. We were very intentional about giving our girls biblical names that reflected what we hoped and prayed would be true of them. Faith was so named because we desired more than anything else in her life that she would be saved by faith in Jesus Christ and that her relationship with her Savior would be the defining thing in her life. Lydia was named after the first believer in Asia and our desire for her was that her salvation would come early and that she would be a leader amongst her peers in her walk with Christ. Very intentional about those names. If I meet somebody whose name is Faith, I already know, chances are pretty good that girl's parents are believers. Because it's a name that, that signifies something important. And the fact is, God has revealed himself to us through his names. And to, and to misuse or misrepresent them is to declare God to be something or someone that he is not. Some of the better known names of God, Elohim, 
meaning God, but it's particularly a God of incredible power. Adonai means Lord. It's a reference to lordship and the, the authority of God. Jehovah or Yahweh is a reference to his divine salvation. And then that's often used in conjunction with other words. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. Jehovah Tzidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. El Olam, the everlasting God. Those names tell us of his character and his faithfulness. And get ready for a little rant here. And a lot of times when I get to ranting, I say, hey, I'm going to step away from the pulpit because this is my opinion. I want to share it with you. But I'm standing right here in the pulpit because I believe every word that I'm about to say is consistent with the heart and the word of God, though it is not specifically in the word of God. Nevertheless, may the rant commence. How much do you have to hate someone to use their name as a swear word? When's the last time you stubbed your toe and yelled out Adolf Hitler? Oh, Adolf Hitler? We don't even hate that guy enough to use his name as a swear word. Ever gotten a paper cut and muttered Jeffrey Dahmer on the way to the Band-Aids? When the lights go on behind you and you're about to get a ticket, do you hit the steering wheel and holler the name of that girl who dumped you two days before senior prom? If we don't hate these people enough to use their name as a swear word, why do I hate our Savior and loving Father enough to do so? It must be considered an absolute slap in the face to treat anyone's name that way, and yet we are consistently willing to endure the abuse of God's name or of Jesus Christ, his son, as people encounter inconveniences and unhappiness. For that matter, when we do something for Christ's sake, it is an act of holy service, not an expression of frustration. Rant concluded. Let's return to our look at the motivation of God's fierce protection of his name. He protects it because it's a very special name, because his name is holy, because names are important. And because God longs for a relationship with us. Remember, I started off by picking on poor Ray Lynn over here, and I said, imagine if her greatest desire was to talk with me. It isn't, I know. But every time I'd say her name, she'd perk up like, is this the moment when I finally get to have a conversation with James? That's my, that's my greatest desire for him is to know him and be known by him. Like the father of the prodigal son, God waits for us to turn to him, and then he runs to meet us. Imagine how he looks forward to hearing from us. Why then would we call out his holy name because we see the cutest shoes, or we had a minor setback, or the slightest injury, or, or whatever the case may be? No, if we're going to use the Lord's name, we need to mean it. Matthew 5, 33 through 37, what, what else is swearing? I know that's not the verse that's on the screen, it's the passage that we read earlier. I used to think only two words were biblically off limits. That was the excuse that I gave when my friends in high school, my youth pastor, confronted me about my swearing habit. Well, hey, there are only two words you're not allowed to use. The Bible says don't use the Lord's name in vain, and I don't. I don't say raka, and I don't. don't even know what that means. So everything else is okay. I was a snot. And I've actually fought the battle against swearing, and for the most part, I've won. Occasionally, it's just amazing. Sometimes an old habit flies out. It's like, where did that come from? Those times are getting fewer and farther between. But it was a long, hard battle, but it was worth the effort. And the Bible has an awful lot to say about swearing and profanity, and I think it applies to this message, even though the second commandment is focused on our adoration and worship of God and the treatment of his name specifically. In other words, it doesn't... The Exodus... 20 verse 7 doesn't directly, directly address our verbal interaction with other human beings. But the principle of guarding our tongues so we don't cause offense to God is clearly parallel. What is profanity? Well, biblically, the word profane literally means outside the temple. And the term originally identified people or things that were secular, 
as opposed to religious. So when we speak of profanity, we are speaking of any words that are outside of the presence of God. In other words, if we wouldn't say it in front of God, we shouldn't say it at all. And not just because he's always with us, but because they are profane, profanity. Furthermore, God spoke creation into place, and so words are important. The word of God. You know, Jesus is called the word dozens of times just in the book of John alone. Matthew 33, uh, 5, 33 through 37 that we read earlier. I think his command here can best be summed up this way. If I could paraphrase, be a person of integrity. Live your life in such a way that you are trusted and you won't have to call upon heavenly or earthly things to back up your statements. There's a man or a woman of integrity. If she says yes, I know the answer is yes. If she says no, it's no. I don't need her or him to swear by anything. I just simply need to hear their word because as people of integrity, I believe them. And what good is it to swear by the things of earth? They all pass away anyway. And swearing by the things of heaven that are not God is to elevate something else to his position. And this was dealt with in the first two commandments. And while to swear by God himself is clearly to break the third commandment. So we are just simply not to take oaths by things on earth or in heaven. Why? James 3, 8 through 10. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it, with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. You ever hear the old expression, you kiss your mother with that mouth when someone's caught swearing? James, the brother of Jesus, is saying much the same thing here. You want to use your mouth to praise God and to curse those created in his image. We go from singing songs of praise and then somebody cuts us off on the way out the parking lot and we use that same tongue to say things that aren't praiseworthy. Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be with grace. Seasoned with salt. That means tasty. Other people enjoy it that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Psalm 1914, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You say, well, I've got a pure heart. It just, you know, my mouth is, is behind my heart. Not in this verse. Profanity is an indication of anger that leads to sin. Consider Peter in Matthew 26, 74. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Peter's swearing is not directly reprimanded in Scripture, but it was important enough for Matthew to include it in his gospel. The problem wasn't so much that Peter swore, but that in his swearing, his weak faith and timid heart were revealed. His sin was exposed, his betrayal of Christ made complete by the profanity that he used. Swearing often indicates a heart that is ready to reject or deny God. And as I mentioned earlier, it's like taking the bricks out of the wall as the enemy attacks. Why weaken our faith in the strong tower that is the name of God? Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. It indicates our words can build up or destroy. I look around here and I see at least three, four, five Five people I know who have been or currently are coaches. You can make or break an athlete with your words. Let no corrupt word proceed from your mouth. But what is good and for necessary edification, absolutely correct. Fix their form, fix their argument, fix the offense or the defense. Do the things you need to do, but do so in a way that it imparts grace. That's not just for coaches, but I just happen to be thinking about how important it has been in my life for, I, think, I don't think I've ever had a female coach, so I can say for men in my life who have coached me well, made me a better athlete, a better football player, a better whatever, and yet also, in some cases, a better man. Proverbs 15.1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. This tells us the use of profanity stirs up anger, while a gentle answer can diffuse difficult situations. 
Christians, we're called upon to live differently and to act differently than a world of unbelievers. And I don't need to speak profanity to win a cursing unbeliever any more than I need to drink alcohol to win an alcoholic. The words of Scripture have all the potency and power we need to reach the heart of the lost. I read an article in the Waterloo Courier a few years ago that I set aside for the next time I got to walk through this topic. And in the article, the author is explaining how even though she is a Christian and the paper's religion editor, even though she writes a weekly column on religion and faith, even though she is well known as a spiritual person, by her own admission, she swears like a pirate. She justifies her decision to keep swearing because she has convinced herself that it is just a societal invention. We've placed naughtiness on words that have no inherent naughtiness. They're only wrong because we've decided they're wrong. And then she explains a letter she received from a reader who took issue with her rationalization. Let me read you part of that article. She writes, One message was particularly thoughtful because I believe the writer has some of the same issues and struggles many of us do, myself included. The writer doesn't swear anymore. She does, however, heavily judge the weight of words. The author wasn't preachy. She just wanted to tell me why she had decided to stop using swear words. And her profound, insightful comments definitely gave me cause to delve deeper into my own actions. And her reasonable arguments moved me to further consider parting ways with profanity. The writer of the letter explained that she believes the word damn is a way of taking God's name in vain. Her reasoning is that God and Jesus are the only ones who can damn someone or something, so to presume to do so is to presume you have such authority and power. Wow, she writes. Then this gal that had written her a letter goes on to say, because we are created in his image and because a sexual relationship between adults is so very sacred, when we use words that degrade these images and relationships, we are, in effect, degrading him in whose image we are created. I believe Christ does say in the Bible not to swear, but to let our conversation be yea, yea or nay, or nay. I also think he meant for us to find release from our stress in faith, not in profanity. I found great wisdom in that. Christians, we ought to, we have to look and act and sound different than the lost world or we will fail to reveal God at work in our lives and we fail to prove the attractiveness of Jesus Christ or the transformational power of the Holy Spirit. Taking the Lord's name in vain is one thing. Trashing the things he created and holds sacred is just a harder slap in the face to our gracious God. And you say, yeah, but you don't understand. James, you don't, you don't get it. What about those people in situations that really really deserve it. Romans 12, 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Need I say more? By the way, as, as often happens, this is certainly one of those mirror messages where I wish I had the big eight-foot mirror here where you could see through to see me, but I know I'm preaching to myself. Do not think that I am somehow standing here today saying... You know when James, in the, the book of James, not me, James says it's a, that no man can tame the tongue. Well, I am the exception. No, my tongue continues to flap in ways that I wish it did not. Nevertheless, let's bring it all to a conclusion. How must we respond to the misuse of God's name? Well, I would say treat every utterance of God's name as a prayer. Do this just a couple of times, and believe me, the people around you will, they'll notice. Okay, first of all, don't say, oh my God, or Jesus Christ, without continuing in prayer. Starting with asking forgiveness for mishandling his name. But if you're going to say, if you're going to address the Lord or use his name, make it the beginning of a prayer. But here's the thing, when somebody else says God's name, oh my God, oh my God. Just stop what you're doing. Dead in your tracks, fold your hands, bow your head, and look down. And they'll go, what are you doing? Oh, I'm sorry, you said, you said God's name. I thought we were going to pray. What? When someone else says God's name, stop and bow your head and then wait for them to say amen. Yes, you'll look like a freak, but you will drive the point home with clarity. You can even use something ridiculous in place of it, but not a sound alike. We do that an awful lot, right? 
we replace something really close so you know what they're trying to say. Look at that freaking thing over there. What am I substituting? You know what I mean? You know darn well what I'm doing. I'm just holying up something I shouldn't say. Banana muffins. There's a good one. Pomegranate navy. I don't even know what that means. Next time you stub your toe, just scream out, pomegranate navy, and everybody go, what is wrong with you? Well, I'm trying really hard to treat the Lord's name as sacred, and I won't even come close to treading on that one. Sweet balloons of Norway. I heard somebody say that once. I'm like, what? <laughs> These stupid sayings will make others question what it is that's different about you, and they'll have some ideas, believe me. But it will open up a discussion on why you have chosen to treat the name of God with the holiness that it deserves. Second thing, beyond just, beyond making sure that you treat the name of the Lord with honor. When somebody uses it, stop to pray and make it obvious so they know. Or or substitute something completely different. The next one is just simply to avoid it. Turn it off. Hang it up, close the tab, whistle to drown it out, leave the room, do what you need to do. Don't tolerate this offense to God. If it wasn't important to him, he would not have put it on his top 10 list, right? So I challenge you to do this. If you are, just just give me one week on this. This week, you're watching TV and they take the Lord's name in vain. Shut off the program. But you don't understand. I got 14 seconds into an hour-long show. I know. Shut it off. Just for a week so you are fully aware of the holiness of God's name. You're reading a book or an article and they misuse it, slam it shut. Be done with it. Somebody uses the, name's Lord, the name of the Lord in vain so they say, you know what? My pastor challenged me this week that anybody or any time I hear the name of the Lord, I'm going to stop, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to end the conversation no matter what it is. So I'm sorry. I don't mean to be offensive to you, but my pastor's kind of weird and he bugged me about it, so I'm just going to cut this conversation off right now because he used the name of the Lord in vain, and I'm really working on that. Well, you might might have some awkward uh, interaction after that, but believe me, they'll think. Treat every utterance of God's name as a prayer. Avoid it, and above all, just don't be guilty of it. Stop using God's name in vain. Stop profaning his creation. Stop belittling his handiwork. Start taming your tongue. It's not a suggestion. It's a commandment. It's not from me. It's from him. And though our culture thinks nothing of it, we who are saved by the name of Jesus must honor it, and we must honor him with all of our words. (coughs) Finally, rest assured, if you are saved, it is not because you obeyed all ten commandments but because Jesus Christ perfectly obeyed the letter and the spirit of every law, fulfilling it on our behalf. We receive no credit for our righteousness that would not be blotted out by our depravity. But by the grace of God, each of our sins can be washed away by faith in Jesus Christ. You see, the real way to make the name of God sacred in our mouths is to make him Lord of our hearts. Fall deeper in love with Christ and work to reveal that love to him and to others with how we use our mouths. That, Christians, is the way to tame the tongue. Let's close in prayer. And our prayer today will come from a number of scriptures. Revelation 15, verses 1 through 4. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. From the 19th chapter of Revelation, in the same book we pray. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. In righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a white robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen white and clean followed him on white horses now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron he himself treads the winepress of fierceness 
the wrath of Almighty God. He has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And so to our great and glorious God, whose name is to be sacred in our mouths and in our hearts, we pray as Paul did in Philippians 2, gratefully acknowledging that we have already bowed our knee and have gladly proclaimed his lordship. For we ourselves pray, from 1 Thessalonians 1, therefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in us you and him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we go forth from this place, may we let the word of God dwell in us richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. And whatever we do in word or in deed, may we do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. From Colossians 3, We pray in Jesus' incomparable and holy name. Amen.